Good morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. My name is Ellen Mantis, and I'm the Director of Science at the Health Effects Institute in Boston. I want to welcome everyone to this webinar on a newly released study from HEI, Health Effects of Traffic-Related Air Pollution, Assessing the Evidence in an Evolving and Complex World. Uh, I will be co-chairing this webinar with Dr. Evi Samali, who is Associate Professor of Epidemiology and Medical Statistics at the University of Athens, Greece. She was a member of the panel who wrote this report and is currently a member of the Health uh, HEI Research Committee. She will be moderating the Q&A session later in this webinar. Um, okay, I'm having trouble advancing the slides. Okay. Well, let me stop sharing my slides and try to do this again. Apologize for this. There we go. So um, just before we begin, uh, we have uh, some logistics to cover. All attendees are muted for the duration of the webinar. Uh, there will be a question and answer period after the presentations, as I met, just mentioned. Please submit your questions via the Q&A function at any time during the webinar. Um, that is not the chat box, it's the Q&A function. So if you're experiencing logistical difficulties, please be sure to use the chat box for that and we'll try to help you resolve those. Uh, the webinar slides and video will be available in the coming weeks. Um, please check the HEI website for details. So for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the Health Effects Institute, we are an independent nonprofit corporation chartered to provide policy relevant, high quality and partial science. Uh, we are funded jointly by the government, um, primarily the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and the worldwide motor vehicle industry, and occasionally we receive funding from private foundations. What do we do? We fund research that is selected, conducted, overseen, and reviewed independently of our HEI sponsors. The people that conduct that work are the HEI staff and the research and review committees that we have, and you can find membership uh, of the committees and our staff on our website if you're interested. Uh, one last note is that we do not take policy positions. So in 2010, we released a traffic and health review. Uh, that panel uh, was convened and looked at the literature up until 2008. Uh, that report had information on emissions, exposure, toxicology, and epidemiology. And at that time, uh, evidence was considered sufficient to support a causal relationship between traffic-related air pollution and exacerbation of asthma in children. Uh, suggested and limited evidence was provided for other health outcomes. So uh, why do we do embark on a new traffic uh, and literature review, uh, health review? So uh, there's been lots of uh, research that's been published since our last review. Uh, regulations have changed. The vehicle technology has advanced. And there's also an interest in non-tailpipe emissions traffic noise. Uh, so in 2008, uh, HEI appointed a new panel to conduct a systematic review of the epidemiologic uh, studies and literature. So this is a picture of our uh, panel that conducted this review. It involved a lot of different people. We had two uh, chairs, uh, Francesco Forestieri and Frederick Lerman, and many other people on this list, uh, mem both members and consultants and uh, contractors to the to the panel and a number of HEI staff. And I'll just point out Hannah Bogart, who uh, was the person who led the review at HEI. And you'll be hearing from many of these people um, during this webinar. The report was subjected to an independent peer review. Uh, this slide simply shows the names of the people that were involved in that review. The, the panel was, the review panel was chaired by Dr. Bert Brunekraft from Utrecht University, where he is a professor emeritus there. So today's webinar, we'll have a number of presentations and uh, the first uh, one by our co-chair, uh, co co 
and followed by an overview of the report by Hannah Bogart, and then a deeper dive into looking at highlights on the different endpoints, and that will be moderated by Jeff Brook, and a final presentation by our last co-chair, and then a Q&A session, as I've already mentioned. So with that, we'll get started with the presentations, and our first up is Dr. Fred Lerman, who is Manager of Exposure Assessment Studies in Sonoma Technology in California. And as I mentioned, he was co-chair of the HEI Traffic Review Panel. So, Fred, you are up. Thank you, Ellen. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Hold on. How about now? Yes. Yes, we see your screen. Hello, thank you, Ellen. Um, I'll be talking about the exposure assessment aspects of the track review uh, study today. And the title is really, as Ellen in indicated, traffic related air pollution, a, a moving target. Um, I'll be covering air quality and mission trends, some of the real world complexity of exposure to traffic related pollution. Uh, our conceptual model of TRAP and the exposure framework that we developed to identify studies suitable for the systematic review. And lastly, um, some things on the traffic specificity ranking that we used in the study. Um, you know, the systematic review relies on studies uh, of its, where the exposure occurred during a period mostly from 1985 to 2015, which was a period with really diverse trends, temporal trends in air pollution. And as this slide on the left shows, which is for PM 2.5, but these trends tend to vary by the uh, country's developmental status where the less developmental countries showed uh, increases over this time period and the more developed countries uh, showed declining trends. And for the systematic review, most of the studies available are from the more developed uh, high income countries. This slide shows trends in ambient NO2 concentrations in the United States. And again, NO2 is a lot more specific to traffic than PM 2.5. And these are trends of groups of trend sites uh, in three different metropolitan areas. But what they show is a fairly dramatic decline in ambient NO2 concentrations over a 30 year period from 1990 to 2020, really a factor of two to three decrease in ambient NO2. This is in contrast to uh, the NO2 here shown for Beijing and Delhi uh, the, in the red line, it's for a shorter time period, but the trend is shows a slight downward trend in China, a slight upward trend in India, much less dramatic than we saw for uh, those several spots in the United States. Now, uh, the trends in emissions really are very similar to the trends in air quality. The trap emissions have declined very substantially during the past several decades in most high income countries. And this is due to the advances in technology cleaner fuels and aggressive regulatory actions. In most middle and low income countries, the trap emissions trends have shown modest decreases or increases during the past decades and deserve more attention going forward. Um, despite the huge improvements, uh, huge reductions in vehicle emissions, there are many vehicle emission challenges re remain. You know, on the technological side, um, we still have high emissions during cold starts and from older and high emitting vehicles and with ultra fines in these direct injection uh, gasoline vehicles. We have uh, concerns with poor compliance and tampering with vehicles and then also emissions cheating. Um, and we have non tailpipe emissions, which 
coming from brake wear, tire wear, and resuspended road dust basically continue to grow with vehicle miles traveled. So they don't go away once we clean up the tailpipe. And lastly, traffic noise. This is really in here because um, fewer than we expected studies uh, in the traffic review included traffic noise and overall traffic noise is not characterized as well as traffic emissions and it's an area where uh, we, we can use some improvement. And the last bullet here is you know, concerns for exposure to trap emissions will persist for decades due to the slow rates of fleet turnover to cleaner technologies, including electrification. And also some things on these next few slides to uh, bring that point home. This here is the slide uh, that Laird presented at the annual HEI conference, conference that shows the distribution of uh, vehicle age in the United States uh, with two snapshots, one for the distribution in 2009, another in 2017. And what it basically shows is the headlines there. <laughs> the vehicles last long are lasting longer and stay on the road longer uh, in these more recent uh, data. And really that is a trend that almost works uh, to decelerate the, uh, the fleet turnover that we're, we're looking for. This next slide shows uh, really the penetration of new technologies into the fleet. This is a projection looking forward uh, and showing the percentage of registered vehicles that are gasoline, hybrid, or electric. And on the left, it shows the projection where it's assumed that in 2035, 100% of the vehicles sold are, are electric vehicles. And with that, we basically uh, see, if we look out to the year 2050, we have about 80% electric vehicles, but still 10% uh, gasoline and 10% hybrids. If there's a more relaxed date for the 100% EV vehicle sales out to 2035, when we look out again 28 years from now, um, we see electric vehicles have reached a little over 60% of the fleet in this projection, hybrids about 30%, and gasoline vehicles about 10%. So these, uh, these vehicles will persist on the road because of the, the, the time it takes to turn over the fleet. Uh, this is a confusing slide, but it shows some of the real world complexity of, of uh, of traffic and uh, related pollution. On the right, um, I want to say these are all data from neighborhoods in Montreal, Canada, uh, and from a uh, mobile platform that was able to collect data on a huge number of, of species here listed on the left side of the slide. But if we first look on the right, what we basically see is uh, scatter plots that show that ultrafine particles in both summer and winter are correlated with NO2, as are black carbon uh, uh, NO2, fairly highly, highly correlated. The slope changes with the seasons, but the correlation persists across the seasons. And if we look on the, the left side where we have this sort of complicated colorful plot, now these are correlation coefficients between species uh, color coded with dark red being um, highly correlated and blue being uh, not correlated. And, uh, green with a dot indicating, uh, you know, unrelated. And what we see in this is a, uh, at these sort of three different measurement sites to varying degrees, uh, strong correlations amongst a group of species. And this is really uh, NO2, NO, NOx, uh, carbon monoxide, uh, ultrafine particles and, and black carbon are the species that stand out repeatedly in multiple sites and multiple locations. And these locations have varying degrees of traffic exposure that are highly correlated. And they're part of this complex mixture. And you know, to some extent, we see PM 2.5 and PM 1 uh, in that fairly highly correlated mix, as well as uh, you know, uh, hydrocarbon, uh, well, organic material and hydrocarbon related aerosol. Now we have a conceptual model of traffic exposures. Uh, this model is one where motor vehicle emissions are the dominant air pollution source in many cities. And second in this model is motor vehicle emit a complex mixture of 
particles and gases, many of which are also emitted by other sources. This is sort of an inconvenient truth, but it, it is the truth. There's no unique tracer for trap, but there are numerous indicator species for both tailpipe and non-tailpipe emissions. And the trap is characterized by high spatial resolution and high temporal, uh, you know, ver high variability spatially and temporally. And for this particular review of long-term effects, we can uh, overcome some of the temporal variability by averaging over that, but we can't get around having to deal with the high temp requirement for high, high uh, spatial uh, resolution in the studies we're looking at. Uh, because TRAP really contributes on multiple spatial scales, including the near road scale, neighborhood scale, urban scale, regional, and global scales. Uh, and this is illustrated somewhat in, in uh, this schematic here shown on the lower right. We have uh, within the urban area, we have various uh, traffic areas. Um, and I think we're all familiar with these ones that have been studied where the effects of major roadways can be detected you know, up to 500 meters downwind of, of those roadways under normal meteorological conditions. And then those, those emissions blend into the background. Uh, they add to the background. In fact, the urban background is, we believe, consists uh, of a lot of contributions from traffic emissions. Uh, but you see these gradients across the city largely determined by traffic. But once you get to the outlying areas, to the rural areas, to the regional background, uh, the trap is no longer really dis distinguishable. There's mixing and reaction that occurs from contributions from other sources. And this obscures the traffic signal once you get to the background, or certainly the continental scale. We developed an exposure framework with this uh, conceptual model in mind. And the goal of this framework is to identify the epidemiologic studies where the exposure contrast is primarily from differences in traffic exposures. Three characteristics are used to select the traffic related studies. The first is it has to be a traffic related pollutant. The second, it has to be on a list of, a, of, of acceptable exposure ass assessment methods or models. And third, it has to have spatial resolution that's sufficient for both the, the indicator pollutant or the, or the surface of that pollutant, the model, and the subject's location. And qualifying studies you know, need to meet acceptance criteria in, in all three areas. Uh, and this framework uh, is designed actually to be inclusive of many different types of, of studies. Oh, something happened there, hold on. Missing some slides. Excuse me for one second. Fred, shall I share my screen? Um, I think it's coming back. Hold on. Can you see that? Yes. No, and uh, only uh, put it in the presenter mode. Yeah, I seem to lose it when I go into presenter mode. Okay, well, go for this one. Let it's me go fine. for this. Excuse me for that interruption there. Um, I said there were three different elements of the exposure framework. The first is the list of traffic specific pollutants, and they are listed here. They're very similar to what was on the previous slide, they include the NO2, NOx, and NO, as well as carbon monoxide and PM 
if it's directly linked linked to traffic, uh, non tailpipe, uh, the PM trace metals, ultra fine particles, various measures of ultra fine particles qualified, as well as various measures of soot, whether it's elemental carbon, black carbon, British smoke, or PM absorption. We have uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and benzene included as well, though there are far fewer studies. And we included measurements that represent indirect measures of traffic exposure, such as distance to road, and length of road, and traffic density. Uh, we next, then second in the exposure framework is the definition of specific exposure assessment methods. And here the first two uh, are uh, the indirect methods. And for those, the scale, we need a thousand meter uh, resolution for the pollution surface and a hundred meter for the address for them to be acceptable. But moving on, we have a criteria of five kilometer for the pollution surface and five kilometer for the address for a series of different approaches or methods. The first being dispersion models and CTM or chemical transport models of traffic. Um, a similar uh, spatial resolution is required for traffic specific source apportionment uh, studies and then land use regression models of traffic including hybrid models and other statistical models uh, as well as uh, studies with uh, that use surface monitoring. But again, this has to be a surface monitoring, a study where the surface monitoring was clearly dominated by traffic and mo majority of all the subject locations need to be within, again, five kilometers of those stations, of all the stations. Um, we also allow satellite monitoring, but that was mostly incorporated into hybrid models these days. And then personal exposure was not acceptable. This exposure framework was really for exposure to ambient air pollution. This slide here shows the indicative scales of exposure contrasts that were uh, uh, acceptable in designs. It starts off with the first row on regional scale models and really regional scale models where the contrast uh, is between cities, uh, you know, over larger length scales. And in that case, is the overall contrast between cities involves not just traffic, but all of the sources in and around cities. And that was not an acceptable approach for this framework. But the next row there shows studies that involve uh, neighborhood scale and urban scale. And in a way, this was the bread and butter of, uh, of the traffic review. Most of the studies fell into this category. And we make the distinction, if it's a single city study, with these type, type of resolution, that's fine. If it's a multi-city study, it has to also have made adjustments in the epi analysis for city or area because we need assurance that the, the variation in exposure it represents the within city variation, which is the exposures we believe are often dominated by traffic. So if it's controlled for city, uh, then we can include multi-city studies. Uh, the large national study, I should point out, were really not included because they didn't make these sorts of adjustments. Uh, we also have a, a lot in the framework uh, studies of more near road studies with health data on a very local scale, less than one kilometer. Those were allowed as well as um, commuting exposure studies, but there were basically very few commuting exposures that had long-term um, you know, uh, timeframes. And lastly, occupational studies were not allowed. Again, this is sort of a framework for ambient exposure. Now, that was the exposure framework. We then uh, came up with a criteria for high rank, moderate and high ranking of traffic specificity. This was used in sensitivity analysis. And what uh, the ranking criteria really are is a more strict uh, application of the overall exposure framework. So for example, instead of having a five kilometer resolution requirement for uh, the exposure models and the subject locations to be high, ranked high for traffic specificity, it really needed to be one kilometer less uh, spatial resolution. And again, for models, clearly models, dispersion models um, or, uh, that use uh, emissions from traffic sources alone were very traffic specific and clearly they qualified as well as traffic specific source enforcement models, although there were far fewer of those. 
Um, we also allowed dispersion models or LUR models, hybrids, uh, if they were very uh, used a one of the very traffic specific pollutants. So if it was NO2, ultrafines, and black carbons, they were allowed. But if it was a PAH or benzene or, or PM mass, it was uh, relegated to more the, the moderate category. I mean, all the, all the, the studies were either moderate or high, uh, and they were ranked according, accordingly. Uh, item four here is we did, you know, consider the high accuracy, traffic density, or distance to road, you know, GIS models with, you know, high quality addresses and roadway data were also ranked high. And when we applied this criteria, we ended up with 79% of the studies were high for one or more pollutants, which we're very pleased with, with that result. With that, let me make some concluding, concluding remarks here. Um, you know, trap emissions and exposures are complex and they're represented simplistically in models, but we think these models have a lot of value. Um, a new exposure framework based on our conceptual model of TREP was developed and applied to select epidemiologic studies. The framework allowed for inclusion of a wide variety of studies, different kinds of models, different um, approaches and so forth. And the majority of these studies had one or more pollutants that met the stricter criteria for high traffic specificity. Um, and then really regarding this whole concern for this moving car target, I have to say, what we see is these trap emissions are declining in most of the high income regions, uh, countries in the, in the world. The concern for exposure to trap emissions will persist for decades, we think, due to the slow rate of fleet turnover to cleaner technologies, including the electrification. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. And now we're gonna move on to a presentation and of the overview of the report by Hannah Bogart. Uh, she is a principal scientist at the Health Effects Institute. And as I mentioned previously, she was the project leader for this traffic review. Thank you, Alan. Um, do you see my screen? Yes. We see your screen. Super. Okay, great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to uh, to have this webinar today and to give you a, a quick uh, overview of the review and uh, and some of the methods we've used before jumping into uh, into the deep dive. So we have published a review protocol. Um, it's online. It's for everybody to see. We've used standard methods um, and we've summarized the epidemiologic results uh, quantitatively where possible. We included an evaluation of the uh, risk of bias in the individual studies. Uh, we've used a tool um, that was also used in the systematic reviews um, underpinning the, uh, the WHO air quality guidelines. And at the end of the day, uh, we reached conclusions about the confidence in the epidemiologic uh, evidence. Um, so we conducted a, a random effect meta-analysis where when at least three studies uh, were available for a, a specific exposure outcome pair. And we've used the exposure increments um, from the ESCAPE study to reflect a uh, realis realistic range of exposure contrasts in most studies. Uh, we've selected uh, estimates from single pollutant models and for the meta-analysis, we've tried to be as inclusive as possible. Um, so only if uh, the same, same study population was used with exactly the same exposure assessment methods, then basically one uh, study was selected for um, meta-analyses. Now, when possible, we uh, also included additional analyses, uh, basically to, uh, to assess consistency in, in subgroups of studies, for example, across uh, different geographical regions and uh, across uh, different uh, publication years, um, etc. So some important uh, features I would like to emphasize here, um, you know, this is really the largest effort of this type to date. Uh, nevertheless, because the research field is so large, uh, the panel needed to come up with some, some painful decisions. For example, uh, we evaluated only the epidemiologic literature 
And we focused on a selected set of health outcomes um, chosen a priori. Now, on this list of outcomes, uh, what is notably missing are the neurologic outcomes. Uh, we included specific chapters in the, in the special report on those neurologic outcomes, but those outcomes were not as systematic assessed as the others, uh, but you'll hear uh, on those outcomes as well uh, today. So as we heard from Fred, uh, we selected only traffic-related air pollution studies. Um, that's not an easy task. We all know that the exposure assessment of traffic-related air pollution is, is, a cha is challenging. Um, it's a complex mixture and, and there's high spatial and temporal variability. And that's exactly why we had to develop this new exposure framework you, you heard about earlier. Um, we assessed the confidence in the evidence. We've used two complementary methods for that. Um, and the panel considered them both equally valuable. And at the end of the day, the two complementary uh, ratings were combined into one overall confidence uh, assessment. So to get to this overall confidence assessment for traffic related air pollution and a particular outcome, as I mentioned, uh, two approaches were used. First using OHAT, and I'll come to OHAT in a second, but basically there were separate assessments uh, for each exposure outcome pair by study design. Those were aggregated for each exposure outcome pair. They were done for each health outcome. And then in addition, a narrative assessment was conducted uh, for traffic related air pollution and the specific outcome. Um, and at the end of the day, we combined those two uh, assessments. So on OHAT, um, there is this initial um, rating um, where um, um, it's based on study design features. You'll see them in the, uh, in the gray box here. And then there is up and downgrading uh, based on certain factors. For example, downgrading based on risk of bias and upgrading based on those response. Um, in original grade uh, guidance, all observational studies, they start at low confidence. Uh, now OHAT decided that also prospective cohort studies um, can start at moderate confidence, whereas in the traffic review, we decided that all cohort studies, as well as case control studies, um, can start at moderate uh, confidence. Why? Basically because three of the four design features that are, that are in this gray box here were often met for those studies. And the only design feature that was not met was the uh, controlled exposure design feature and only randomized controlled trials uh, meet that requirement uh, for a high initial confidence. Now, the panel deemed it necessary to accompany uh, this grade type assessment with a broader narrative assessment. Um, the panel was convinced that the uh, grade methods uh, remain imperfect. Uh, the application was very challenging, uh, partly due to this uh, mechanistic up and down grading uh, due to certain factors and really other reasons to develop this complementary narrative assessment was because grade type assessment, they focus really on the quality uh, of the body of evidence and it was heavily geared uh, towards studies entering a meta-analysis. Now, of course, uh, both assessment, they consider many of the same aspects that are relevant for evidence synthesis, but there were some differences, sometimes pretty subtle uh, differences. For example, uh, the magnitude and the direction of the association, um, as well as consistency of the findings, they really played a major role in the uh, narrative assessment. For example, uh, associations that were replicated uh, across locations, across time periods, different study designs, uh, they were more likely uh, to represent a true association um, compared to isolated uh, observations from small um, single studies. And there were other um, differences. Next, I'm going to show you a, a few sort of some high level uh, descriptive results uh, slides before jumping into the uh, 
into the deep dive. So we've searched all the literature starting um, in 1980 all the way up to um, 2019. So the start date uh, was the same as the ACI uh, 2010 review. And after a broad search, we included about 350 uh, studies in the systematic review. About half of them entered a meta-analysis. And in addition, we included uh, 69 studies on neurologic outcomes, and we conducted separate uh, literature reviews on those. So respiratory effects in children, as well as, in, as, well as birth outcomes, were the most common uh, outcomes that were studied. Fewer studies investigated cardiometabolic effects, uh, respiratory effects in adults, and uh, mortality. And really, most of the studies were published after uh, 2008, so relatively recent. Um, so, 2008, so October 2008 was the cutoff date of the uh, earlier HEI report. So, most of the studies were either conducted in Europe or uh, in North America. Studies in Asia, predominantly China, emerged uh, more recently, and there's a clear need for uh, more traffic-related uh, air pollution and health studies in low- and uh, middle-income countries. Um, so you'll see here the number of studies by outcome and pollutant. NO2 was the exposure indicator that was most widely studied, followed by elemental carbon slash black carbon and PM2.5. Also, about half of the studies included uh, indirect traffic measures, such as traffic distance or uh, traffic density. And although those studies are informative, uh, the panel could not combine them for use in meta-analyses because of all those uh, varying definitions. Uh, also, a note that there were very few uh, long-term studies identified for some uh, pollutants, specifically ultrafine particles and uh, non-tailpipe PM components. And just a last note that many of the studies reported more than one exposure metric. And of course, uh, we extracted all the information for all those pollutants as long as they uh, met the uh, exposure framework. So that was it for that was it uh, for for me. Um, so we'll we'll jump now into uh, the deeper dive um, about uh, regarding some of the uh, some of the health outcomes. So I think I'll go give the word first to Ellen. I believe Ellen, you're up. Yes. Um, so the Jeff Brook is going to take over and do the deeper dive, uh, moderate this uh, session. And he is assistant professor of the University of Toronto at, uh, in Canada. And he worked for many years for the Environment Canada. Jeff is a member of the traffic review panel, and he is also currently a member of the HEI research committee. So Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, great to hear everything going so far. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, you know, uh, among a range of factors, traffic related air pollution's potential impact on health depends upon outcome and the biological pathways that are involved. And coherence within and among groups is an important part of the evidence. Six of the panel members who play key roles in assessing outcomes to big results are going to share a brief overview of the findings now. These are Danielle Vianot, who's an assistant professor at the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute in Switzerland at the University of Basel in Switzerland. Uh, Andres Margiasi is an associate professor at the University of Montreal in Canada. Barbara Hoffman is a professor of environmental epidemiology at the University of Dusseldorf, Germany, and on the HEI Research Committee. Harald Hoek is an associate professor at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Sharon Sagiv is an associate adjunct professor of epidemiology at the University of California, Berkeley, and Jennifer Weave is an associate professor at Boston University. So we're gonna hear uh, briefly from each of these in their different outcome groups, starting with Danielle. Are you all set, Danielle? I am. Okay, great. Yeah, so for the birth outcomes, we looked at three different measures of fetal growth and growth restriction. These were term low birth weight, term birth weight, small for gestational age. And we also looked at preterm birth. So as Hannah showed in total, we had 86 studies that we included in the review. And the majority of these were actually cohort studies. 
They also, the majority focused on whole pregnancy as the exposure window, and many of them studies were conducted in North America and Europe. A large number of these studies were also based on birth registry data. And in terms of the exposures, most were also deemed to be highly traffic specific. Next. So for track, and, oh, first I'll orient you to this slide because I think you'll see it a number of times in this deep dive. So along the, the Y axis, showing the summary estimate, and along the X is the different pollutants. Now for birth outcomes, we have different um, boxes here. The main one to focus on is the dark one, which is showing the estimate for the entire pregnancy window. The others reflect those for the specific trimesters. And at the bottom, just above the pollutants, you'll see the number of studies in each of these meta-analysis. So this is term low birth weight. So what we found here is that the strongest associations were for PM 2.5 in the entire pregnancy window. So that's the box on the right hand. For NOx and elemental carbon, the associations were weaker. And for NO2, which is the shaded box there, they were basically null. In some of the sensitivity analysis, um, we did detect some regional differences with stronger associations for some of the pollutants in Western Europe compared to other areas. And also the studies that looked at the shape of the dose response, they were finding monotonic increase. So for this birth outcome, we, uh, our, our rating uh, based on the meta-analysis was a moderate confidence in the presence of an association. And the studies that actually weren't included in the meta-analysis were, were consistent with this assessment. Next. So we also found a, quite a consistent association between PM and the different growth restriction outcomes that we looked at. So you'll see here for term low birth weight and small for gestational age, um, that all of the, well, the majority of those individual studies that went into these uh, forest plots here all had effect estimates above that reference line. And also for the term birth weight, which is our continuous measure with a negative coefficient indicating an adverse effect, um, all, pretty much all of the studies were below that line. So quite consistent picture. Next. So for preterm birth, it was a little bit different. Um, as you can see in this plot, basically we saw null associations pretty much for well, across all of the pollutants in terms of the entire pregnancy window. And if I was showing the forest plots, which I'm not, we would see quite clearly that the individual studies going into these meta-analysis really had effect estimates that were both above and below unity. There were, however, a small number of very specific traffic PM 2.5 studies, and these all did show associations. However, we couldn't, they weren't similar enough to include in a meta-analysis. So for preterm birth, our assessment was a low confidence in the presence of an association, um, but there was, as I mentioned, some supporting evidence pointing to an association. Next. So now this is just a, a the real overview of, of all the results from the meta-analysis first. So for each of those exposure outcome pairs and showing those summary estimates as well as the number of studies. And then they're color coded according to the modified OHAD assessment. So this is in the confidence and the quality of the body of evidence with high being shown there in the dark blue. So what you should see from this is that, you know, uh, less than half of our studies were actually um, deemed to be moderate or high. Um, at the very last column on the right hand side there, this is the overall assessment in the confidence in association with TRAP for each of these outcomes. So sort of looking across all of the evidence that we included. And our final determinations here was that we had a moderate conf confidence in association with TRAP for term low birth weight, as well as small for gestational age, while the other two birth outcomes, we had a low confidence. Next. Oh, well, that's it. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, excellent, uh, Danielle, um, for a little deep dive into birth outcomes. Uh, you mentioned that many of the studies uh, were from large birth registry studies. How did you find that this influenced the findings, if it did? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I mean, birth registries are, of course, really great. They cover very large populations. Um, but one of the downsides is that they often lack very detailed covariate information. So for us, 
you know, what that meant is that a lot of these studies lacked either one or both of maternal smoking or pre-pregnancy BMI. And what this meant is that um, many of these exposure outcome pairs were then assigned a high risk of bias in that risk of bias assessment. And this could have then led to, or did lead to some downgrading then in our confidence assessment. Ah, okay, Th thanks. thanks for that clarification. Okay, moving along to the next set of outcomes, uh, we want to hear from Audrey Smargiasi, University of Montreal, about the respiratory outcomes that were assessed as part of this review. Are you ready to go, Audrey? I am. Thank you. Great. Okay, so uh, most studies uh, on respiratory outcomes were in children. As it was mentioned, they were published after 2008. Um, they use different designs, cohort studies, cross-sectional studies mostly, and different methods to assess exposure, mostly models, but some studies use monitors. They were from Asia. Um, of note, we considered exposure, early, the earliest exposure, so exposure during pregnancy or at birth. We gave a preference to, to uh, the estimates of associations with these earlier exposures. Most of these were from Europe and North America. They controlled for individual characteristics, uh, lifestyle characteristics such as smoking, but uh, administrative uh, uh, cohorts or uh, studies based on administrative data used area level adjustments. Next slide. So I will talk about the main outcomes first. So asthma onset in children, most studies were from cohort studies. Um, as you can see, most of them, uh, well, all studies that were meta-analyzed, all meta-estimates were positive, but there was um, uh, imprecision except for NO2. Now, uh, the uh, confidence interval for the meta-estimate for NO2 did uh, slightly include unity. Um, and it was uh, heterogeneous, actually, because there were some individual studies that were meta-analyzed that were negative, and also because some of the uh, studies, single studies meta-analyzed with NO2 um, that were based on uh, uh, administrative databases were uh, smaller, the estimates were smaller. Um, next. Now for infections in children, so acute lower respiratory infections, again, here I present the meta estimates. So they were, we, we were, uh, we performed two meta analysis. It was not possible to perform meta analyses with the other pollutants. Now the meta estimates for those two pollutants, so NO2 and environmental carbon were positive. The meta estimate with NO2 uh, was positive. The confidence interval did not include Unity, and actually the heterogeneity here was relatively low. Um, those studies on infections were very diverse. They uh, used different designs, but many were cohort studies. Uh, they considered different uh, infections. Uh, next slide. Now in adults, uh, for asthma onset, uh, we were, um, it was possible to perform a meta-analysis with NO2. It was the only meta-analysis possible. As you can see, uh, well, all those studies were cohort studies except one. And as you can see, they all had positive uh, estimate of association and the meta-estimate was positive except one very small case control study that contributed very little to the uh, meta estimate. Next slide. So now here uh, for our overall confidence in the evidence of an association between long-term exposure to traffic-related air pollutant trap and respiratory outcomes. So uh, the uh, overall assessment for asthma onset in children, in adults, and for infections, so the three lines in pink. Uh, so the overall assessment was moderate to high. But if you look at the, there were slight differences 
differences between the uh, more mechanical assessment uh, based on the OHA tool uh, and the narrative assessment as Anna presented um, those assessment, uh, the narrative assessment did consider aspects that were not considered in the OHAP tool. For example, some pollutants were not metanalyzed, and we considered this evidence when we uh, perform our uh, narrative assessment. So we considered a lot uh, of uh, many more um, outcomes than those in pink, and I did not uh, mention them uh, because of time, but we uh, considered active and uh, ever asthma reported by questionnaire in children and in adults. In children, you can see the evidence is moderate, and it's basically mostly because those studies were cross-sectional and they used uh, um, a, que um, a questionnaire. Um, many more outcomes, uh, other outcomes were also considered, such, such as COPD or um, infections in adults, and also exacerbation of chronic respiratory diseases, but the evidence was very low because uh, of the small number of studies. Um, and uh, one last point that I would like to make is that um, for those outcomes in pink, where we considered that the evidence was high, there was was also evidence uh, based on studies that were not meta-analyzed and based on associations with indirect traffic measures, such as um, uh, traffic density, uh, that contributed also to our overall assessment. Merci, Audrey. Uh, so much to try to summarize in such a brief amount of time there. Um, and we'll have time at the end for a, a broad set of questions, but I'm just wondering, you know, respiratory outcomes have been studied for quite some time. And if you were to think back to the, the 2010 review by Health Effects into Traffic Air Pollution and, and now to fast forward to this review, you know, what do you think are some of the, the main you know, changes in the evidence around respiratory outcomes? Is there a sort of a nutshell takeaway uh, summary? Well, yes, we actually bring new evidence regarding associations with infections and also asthma onset in adults. Uh, now, the evidence is mostly based on NO2, uh, still mainly based on NO2. The former report uh, presented association, reported associations with exacerbation of asthma, and our definition of exacerbation of asthma is a bit different than in the previous report, because active asthma was considered as the studies uh, reporting exacerbation in the former report. Um, and in our case, here we uh, considered or classified exacerbation when we looked at subpopulations of those with uh, chronic respiratory diseases. So there's slight differences between our conclusion because we classified the outcomes differently, but we bring new evidence regarding uh, outcomes in adults and infections. Okay, yeah, that, that's great to, to clarify it that way. Uh, we're going to need to move on. So we're going to now move on to looking at uh, cardiometabolic, cardiometabolic outcomes. Uh, and Barbara Hoffman from the University of Dufeldorf is going to give us a summary of uh, that group's findings. Barbara, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, and here's my first slide. So um, first of all, in comparison to the 2010 um, um, traffic uh, review, we had a substantial increase in published studies from four studies in 2010 to 57 studies now. And you can see the number of studies here in this, um, in this table. Um, we looked at uh, basically four different uh, outcomes, um, ischemic heart disease, and I apologize for the mix up in numbers here. The ischemic heart disease line has the numbers from the coronary events. So actually we had 20 studies for ischemic heart disease including 11 into the meta-analyses. And then we looked at coronary events, a um, subgroup of ischemic heart disease that targets um, very specific events like myocardial infarction and um, sudden cardiac death. We had 11 studies here and seven studies included in the meta-analyses. Um, then we, had, um, we looked at stroke events, um, including ischemic as well as hemorrhagic stroke and we analyzed diabetes mellitus. And this was actually the only um, outcome where we were able to uh, differentiate between incidence and prevalence because we actually had studies 
enough studies for um, both outcomes. In for the other three outcomes here, we um, the evidence was pretty much um, um, based on incident studies only. Um, the evidence uh, base we had was like in the other outcomes that we heard about before, was dominated by studies from Europe and North America. Um, many studies could not be included in the meta-analysis because um, they only included indirect traffic measures. Um, so, or we had less than um, three um, studies available for per pollutant, so we couldn't do a meta-analysis. Um, where possible, we stratified meta-analysis according to fatality of the outcome. And in contrast to the mortality studies we hear about later, um, these studies here excluded diseased individuals at baseline. Um, so these were, um, um, yeah, these included actual incident studies and um, um, were in a disease-free population um, at the beginning of the study period. Uh, next slide, please. So um, starting with the first outcome, ischemic heart disease, you can hear, see here um, uh, the plots that you have seen before. On the x-axis, you see the different um, pollutants and on the y-axis, the um, relative risk for the um, summary of the summary estimates. And uh, what you can see here for ischemic heart disease is that we had clear null associations for the gases, pollutants, NO2 and NOx, whereas um, the, the particulate pollutants showed um, positive effect estimates. In the subgroup analysis, we generally found stronger and more consistent estimates for fatal disease. Um, in several studies, we found monotonic exposure response functions and we also had additional support for, um, for, from, from indirect um, traffic measures, uh, from studies on PM cores and PM uh, from um, non-tailpipe or non-tailpipe indicators. Uh, we also had four studies that looked at um, adjustment for noise and found robust um, estimates. Next, please. For stroke, uh, the picture was uh, relatively similar, once again, with um, null associations for the gases pollutants and positive um, effect estimates for the particulate um, pollutants, however, relatively imprecise. Um, similar to ischemic heart disease, we also had additional support uh, from traffic um, specific PM fractions. And also for stroke, uh, we had a relatively with, uh, um, uh, robust um, estimates after adjustment for noise. Next, please. Uh, the picture was quite different for diabetes mellitus. Um, here we see positive effect estimates for NO2 and prevalence of diabetes mellitus, as well as for um, incidence and um, for NOx and incidence. Um, of diabetes mellitus, whereas the um, um, particulate um, pollutants, they also showed positive estimates, uh, but once again, um, quite imprecise and all of them overlapping uh, with unity. Uh, we had quite a bit of additional support from indirect traffic measures. Six, six out of seven studies showed um, associations here. Uh, we also had additional support for NO2, ultrafine particles, and traffic-specific PM fractions. And once again, uh, four out of five studies that adjusted for noise uh, showed um, uh, robust um, estimates. Uh, we also saw that the, those studies that uh, conducted a more extensive confounder control, including lifestyle, um, 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 lifestyle variables, um, and who also did an outcome assessment based on clinical examinations, uh, that these studies yielded uh, higher estimates and uh, lower heterogeneity in meta-analysis, which actually led to an upgrade in, the, in our OHAT um, confidence assessment. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the overall assessment for uh, the studies in the cardiometabolic uh, chapter 
Uh, in the first uh, column, you see the result for the narrative assessment with um, a moderate um, assessment for ischemic heart disease and coronary events, uh, for, um, as well as for uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and uh, low um, confidence for coronary events, where we had only very few studies and um, only um, one meta-analysis. Um, the confidence assessment for the quality of the body of evidence um, uh, looked as follows. We had moderate uh, confidence for the studies on ischemic heart disease and on um, type 2 diabetes mellitus, whereas um, the confidence was low for coronary events and stroke, which led to the final overall assessment of moderate for ischemic heart disease and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Um, low to moderate for stroke and low for coronary events. In general, um, the body of evidence showed that we saw stronger effects for fatal disease. And this is uh, actually in line with the high ratings for cause specific mortality outcomes that we will see later on in this session here. Um, one important aspect is that in the um, assessment of these outcomes, we excluded uh, non-fatal subclinical precursor conditions or short-term studies that would probably have added quite a bit more um, evidence, for example, studies on um, insulin sensitivity uh, or an atherosclerosis. Uh, these were not assessed uh, in this exercise here. Uh, we conducted a repeated search in um, early 22 this year for stroke and diabetes and the additional studies that we found, they strengthened the conclusions of moderate evidence for these outcomes. Um, and um, overall in terms of uh, underpinning um, toxicology and mechanistic evidence, there's uh, specifically for nitrogen oxides and cardiometabolic outcomes um, we still need more um, mechanistic studies to really um, explain the associations that we see in the epidemiological studies. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, there, there's certainly more to try to tie together there to, to get a full picture. Um, and you're talking about uh, fatal disease and more acute events or other uh, types of events. So um, could you elaborate a bit more on sort of the, the distinction between the coronary events and ischemic heart disease in general? Uh, how do they differ and, you know, and uh, what were the results in terms of like sort of comparing those two outcomes that yeah. you know, might shed more light? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, ischemic heart disease in the studies was a very, was very often very broadly defined with sometimes also including retinal disease, um, uh, sometimes even excluding um, uh, or including um, specific types of atherosclerosis. So it, it included a lot of um, uh, very broad and sometimes not very well-defined outcomes, whereas um, the subgroup of coronary events, uh, these were um, a group of studies that had um, a very clear heart outcome like myocardial infarction and sudden cardiac death, so very clearly defined, but um, these studies then we had only very few of those and therefore the evidence was um, just not, um, um, we just didn't have enough evidence to do these in-depth meta-analyses that we could do for ischemic heart disease. So um, that's one of the reasons why for coronary events, the um, overall assessment is still um, at low, uh, at low confidence, just mainly because of um, lack of enough studies. Lack of studies, okay, all right. Uh, yeah, thanks for linking those together uh, more, that's great. Okay, we're gonna move on now uh, away from morbidity to uh, the final uh, group of types of studies where we did meta-analysis uh, and Harad Hope from Utrecht is gonna talk about uh, mortality studies and associations. Uh, Harad, I hope you're ready. All, all set. Okay, great. Go ahead. Okay. So also for mortality, the setting is that uh, we uh, had access to many more studies looking at traffic-related air pollution um, uh, than in the 2010 uh, review. Uh, in total, we had uh, 48 studies looking at all-cause uh, and cause-specific mortality, and 31 of them looked at uh, all-cause mortality. 
Uh, in this uh, presentation, I will focus uh, on all-cause mortality, illustrating some of the issues we uh, encountered. Um, um, we, we selected uh, 31 studies, and that means that quite a few cohort studies on air pollution were not selected. Um, some well-known studies because they were not sufficiently uh, traffic specific, and that includes studies on PM2.5 in the American Cancer uh, Society cohort and the Medicare uh, cohort. Um, as for other outcomes, most of the studies we selected in our review were from Europe and uh, North America. And the evidence base included uh, both classical cohort uh, studies uh, with detailed lifestyle uh, information and some very large population based uh, studies. Next slide. So this presents in the format that you're now used to the uh, meta-analysis of all the pollutants for which we could perform a meta-analysis. Um, if you look at this uh, graph, you will notice that uh, all the summary effect estimates are above unity, so indicating more mortality at higher pollution levels. And for the pollutants that are were most uh, studied, those are NO2, 11 studies, elemental carbon, also 11 studies, and PM2.5, 12 studies, you note that there are very narrow confidence intervals and um, effect estimates uh, do not, con the confidence intervals do not contain uh, unity, so statistically significant uh, associations. Um, next uh, slide. Uh, this shows you for one of the uh, most studied pollutants, namely NO2, the uh, forest plot, so showing the individual studies that uh, contribute to these meta-analytic summary estimate that you saw on the previous uh, slide. And if you go through this uh, slide, you notice that uh, virtually all uh, effect estimates are positive. Um, another point to note from this uh, graph is that uh, the weight of these studies uh, indicates that there is not a single study contributing heavily to the overall summary estimate, which is a desirable feature in these uh, overall uh, assessments. Um, the other thing to note from, the, um, from this graph is that there is a high uh, heterogeneity if judged from the I-square uh, uh, value, so that at 83% that was judged as, as high. Um, but this um, heterogeneity derives from differences, differences in magnitude of the association and not so much of the direction of the association. And it's also important to realize that this I square is expressed on a relative uh, scale. That's why it's in percentages. And if you look at this column of relative risks, one could also argue that these relative risks are all uh, small, but some smaller than others. Next one. So um, the narrative assessment uh, based on this uh, literature and some of the considerations I will um, go through with you in a second resulted in a high confidence in an association between traffic related air pollution and all um, cause mortality. And that was based on the fact that we saw consistent associations for multiple uh, pollutants, um, based on the fact that we had a sizable number of uh, well-conducted cohort uh, studies, adjusting for major covariates, including lifestyle factors, but also uh, socioeconomic status on both the individual and the area level uh, address, uh, scale. And both uh, scales can be important as uh, confounders. Um, the evidence base was um, uh, comprised of studies in very different uh, locations across Europe and North America, but also some in Australia and, and Asia. And that's an important uh, observation because confounding is less likely um, as um, the association between pollution and lifestyle and socioeconomic status is not identical across uh, the globe. In some uh, locations, high pollution goes along with high SES. In other locations, high pollution goes along with low SES. It's not consistent. Um, as uh, we saw in the previous observation, the um, risk estimates for air pollution were robust to, ad to adjustment for traffic noise. Um, the um, um, uh, study, studies were conducted by different uh, research uh, groups and there were support from studies not included in the meta-analysis you just saw, uh, including studies from pollutants not included in the uh, meta-analysis and uh, studies using, using uh, traffic metrics like traffic intensity and distance to a uh, major road. Next slide. Um, 
The second um, assessment we did was the modified overhead assessment. Um, we uh, had a few uh, downgrades related to imprecision, especially for the pollutants with relatively few uh, studies and for one uh, component uh, because of risk of bias. And then we had upgrades for a monotonic exposure response function for especially the most studied pollutants and one upgrade for consistency uh, across uh, regions. And that resulted in uh, a high confidence for PM2.5, NO2 and elemental carbon, moderate confidence for NOx and PM10 and low confidence for copper and iron which resulted in uh, a high confidence for traffic related air pollution combined based on the observation that the most uh, studied uh, pollutants had high confidence. Next. So conclusions from this, um, we had a high confidence in an association with traffic related air pollution and all cause uh, mortality. Uh, and despite the fact that we had trouble in uh, applying this formal OHAT um, uh, assessment methodology, the uh, assessment from the formal and the narrative uh, assessment agreed uh, in this case. And our assessment also broadly agrees uh, with uh, other assessments by authoritative uh, bodies like the US uh, EPA, particularly the, that on in, uh, PM 2.5. And the difference of course is that they, their specific pollutants are uh, evaluated irrespective of the source. And as a conclusion, um, that implies that policies reducing traffic related air pollution will deliver health uh, benefits. And that's it. <clears throat> okay, great. Much appreciated, Herard. Uh, really great, thorough overview of so much information. And I know you know you were stuck with uh, with basically all cause mortality. It's it's really tempting to think about you know cause specific mortality, especially how it might tie back to morbidity. Um, is there uh, some aspects of cause specific mortality that um, you find particularly interesting that you can share with us? Yeah, yeah. so we, we did the same assessment also for cause specific uh, mortality. And uh, what we ended up with was a high confidence for circulatory and ischemic heart disease uh, mortality, um, a um, high to moderate assessment for lung cancer mortality, moderate for respiratory mortality, and then lower assessment for stroke and uh, COPD uh, mortality. And that last part is partly related to the smaller number of studies in those, uh, those outcomes. Ah, okay, uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, now we're moving on to the um, two reviews here that were uh, more narrative in nature. We did not do meta-analysis for these, but there is clearly growing interest and in evidence in terms of the effects on the brain at, at all ages. So we're going to hear from uh, Sharon Sagib first about neurodevelopmental outcomes related to air pollution. So Sharon, if you're ready, go ahead, please. Yes, um, thank you, Jeff. So as Jeff said, neurodevelopment is a relatively new area of study in air pollution research, but as you will soon see, one with a growing literature. Uh, by way of definition, neurodevelopment encompasses brain development in the fetus and the child across multiple dimensions of function. For this review, we selected three main categories of neurodevelopment, including cognitive function, as well as two neurodevelopmental um, disorders and their related traits. Those include attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and autism spectrum disorders. As Hannah mentioned, we didn't conduct a formal meta-analysis or confidence assessment for this relatively new outcome um, for air pollution, um, but given this rapid growth, I suspect we soon will. The panel saw a strong rationale for including neurodevelopment in this review, given the susceptibility of the developing brain to environmental toxicants, as demonstrated by legacy chemicals such as lead and methylmercury. And just to show you evidence for the rapid growth in this literature, this graph at the bottom right shows the steep rise in the number of studies on air pollution and just ASD, uh, autism spectrum disorders alone. Uh, and this is just in the past decade. Uh, next slide, please. For our first outcome, a category of outcomes, cognitive function, we looked at poor performance or delayed development of function over a range of domains, including IQ, learning and memory, language, visual spatial abilities, attention, and executive function. We identified 30 studies of TRAP and these cognitive outcomes measured in children at ages one to 20 years across 18 different study populations uh, conducted primarily in Europe and North America. 
Most used a prospective cohort design and sample sizes ranged widely. Of note, 10,000 is a very large study um, for, uh, of neurodevelopment and was the result of pooling cohorts like the ESCAPE effort, which um, has already been described to some extent. Um, since we didn't conduct any meta-analyses here, we don't have any of the pretty forest plots, so I'll be providing a more qualitative narrative assessment of our findings. Um, overall, we found moderate confidence in an association between TRAP and cognitive function. About half the studies reported associations of NO2, elemental carbon, or PM2.5 assessed during both gestation and childhood with at least one measure of cognitive function. Associations were found across different domains, but mostly with general intelligence, attention, and working memory. Evidence for other pollutants were null or scant, um, and there were mixed associations with the indirect traffic measures. Next slide, please. For our second category of outcomes, we looked at clinically diagnosed ADHD, as well as related behaviors, which include inattention, hyperactivity, and poor impulse control. There were a total of eight studies of ADHD assessed at ages four to 15 years, which included seven different study populations all set in Europe and North America. And all but one study used a prospective cohort design um, and again, a big range in sample sizes. For ADHD, we found low confidence in the presence of an association with TRAP with most studies reporting null associations and really only a handful reporting modest associations of childhood exposure to NO2, elemental carbon, and PM2.5. Next slide, please. Our third and final category of outcomes were clinically diagnosed autism spectrum disorders and uh, related behaviors, which include social cognition, social communication, and restricted and repetitive behaviors. We identified 14 studies of children aged two to 13 years, the time of assessment, in 11 different study populations, again, mostly in Europe and North America, but also in parts of Asia. For autism, studies were mostly case control studies, though there were a few prospective cohort studies. Um, and as with other outcomes, uh, the sample sizes were really um, variable. Um, most of the studies did look at uh, autism diagnosis. We found the highest confidence for ASD studies compared with other categories of neurodevelopment with moderate to high confidence in the presence of an association with gestational and early life exposure to NO2 and PM2.5. Associations were more equivocal for other trap pollutants and indirect measures of traffic. Notably, there was some geographical heterogeneity in the findings, which I don't have time to get into here. Next slide, please. In summary, there were a total of 49 studies of trap and neurodevelopment included in this review, representing 30 distinct um, study populations. Confidence range from low to ADHD to moderate to cognitive function to moderate to high for ASD or autism. We identified a number of limitations in these studies of which I'll just name a few that I think could give rise to where future studies may want to direct their efforts. Uh, first, there was quite a bit of heterogeneity of outcome, especially for, uh, for cognitive function, which makes arriving at a consensus particularly challenging for these endpoints. Um, this will also complicate efforts to meta-analyze these studies at some point, um, and a common set of endpoints could really help with this. This is not particular to air pollution, this, this, this occurs across neurodevelopmental studies. And despite some large sample sizes, many studies still had limited sample size, which made it difficult to produce effect estimates with any precision. Um, and as always, larger studies help, but also studies looking at continuous neurodevelopmental outcomes does improve study power. I didn't speak at all to covariate inclusion, and most studies did include the most important confounders, such as socioeconomic status, uh, and a scattering of studies included environmental, have, um, environmental factors, including noise, but a common set of confounders would really here, help here as well. Finally, we don't know, yet know the most sensitive window of exposure, and studies reported associations with both gestational and childhood trap exposure. This is plausible given the long period of neurodevelopment, which starts from early gestation through adulthood, but better identification of the mechanisms underpinning these associations would help with identification of these critical periods and vice versa. Okay, I'll end here. Thank you. Sharon, that's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> uh, really interesting and uh, learning a lot over the last while. So it's gonna be great to watch this field evolve more and more. And it's, it's nice and sort of this broader review, review you've had to be able to think, you know, think about things, how they connect.
Uh, and do you have any insight really about sort of the mechanisms behind this neurological development outcomes and you know, how that might even speak to early life or prenatal or any of those aspects? It'd be great to hear more about what your thoughts are on mechanisms. Yeah, that's a great question, Jeff. Uh, the short answer is, is we don't exactly know, but we have some ideas. And of course, as you mentioned, it depends on the window of exposure and the outcomes assessed, of which there were many that we looked at in these studies. So with respect to gestational trap exposure, studies show that some of these pollutants cross the placenta, um, and so they do reach the developing fetus. And exposure during pregnancy can also lead to suboptimal placental growth, which can also impact the fetus. Um, in addition, markers of oxidative stress have been shown in maternal peripheral blood and uh, importantly in cord blood. With respect to childhood exposure, particles, particular ultrafines have been shown to enter the brain via the circula circulatory system as has been talked about um, in other, uh, some of the other outcomes, but they can also directly access the brain via the olfactory system. So in a, um, there is some, some um, something suggesting that there may be some direct exposure to the child. Uh, in addition, neuroinflammation in children has been documented with air pollution. And all of these perturbations can give rise to suboptimal fetal and child development, which could have direct or downstream impacts on the highly sensitive developing nervous system. Okay, good. Yes, uh, lots of uh, room for more studies there for sure. Uh, and as we continue to think about uh, the effect on the brain, we're going to switch to sort of long, lifelong exposure to air pollution and neurodegenerative diseases. So Jennifer Weave is going to wrap up our deep dive talking about those outcomes next. Uh, if you're ready, Jennifer, go ahead. I am. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, and uh, so this will be a bit shorter because it's really the place where we have the least evidence, although that evidence base is growing. So first of all, let me tell you about the outcomes that we included in this section. Those included dementia and outcomes related to dementia, and I'll detail those later, but the preview is that they include cognitive decline and cognitive function. The other major outcome we considered was Parkinson's disease. Now, again, we did not perform any meta-analyses of these findings or confidence assessments, just a narrative assessment. Now, why include these outcomes? Well, there is the public health burden of dementia, which affects almost 55 million people in the world. Um, Parkinson's disease is also a common condition of older age as well, affecting over 6 million older adults throughout the, the world. Now, there has been, as I mentioned, a rapid increase in the number of studies looking at air pollution generally and also tr um, TRAP more specifically in relation to these outcomes. And that's what I'll be telling you about today. Next. So first, dementia and related cognitive outcomes. Now, overall, our review included 15 studies that were set in 10 specific unique cohorts. Now, among those, uh, there were, let me just tell you about the studies of cognitive uh, function. And this is essentially comparisons of people's cognitive level at a specific point in time. Next. There are, there are six of those studies. The other outcome related to dementia is the rate of cognitive decline over time. Next. And there were three of those studies. And finally, we looked at studies of dementia incidence and um, incidence of mild cognitive impairment. And there were six studies of dementia and one study of MCI. Now, the study sizes ranged between a few hundred to over two million. The latter studies were generally set in um, healthcare databases. All of the studies occurred in Europe or North America. Most of them followed cohort designs, although some were cross-sectional. Next, please. Now, of the TRAP measures included in these studies, most included studies of traffic density or distance from busy road. Um, and behind that were studies of elemental carbon, nitrogen dioxide, and behind those were traffic-related PM2.5 and NOx, with fewer studies on PM10 and coarse fraction PM. Next. Now the overall pattern of findings I'm describing mainly in terms of either adverse associations of TRAP with, with the outcomes versus no association or inverse. Um, and adverse essentially is a, is a way to summarize the different directions of findings we would expect to see with these different outcomes. Now, the most suggest 
consistently adverse findings were with respect to NO2 and NOx. Less consistent were studies of PM2.5, elemental carbon, and the distance and density measures. Now, the evidence, as you saw on the previous slide, uh, with respect to PM10 and, and coarse PM, were those findings were quite sparse and the results were inconsistent. Now, there are some pretty serious challenges, um, although I, I believe they are surmountable, in conducting this research. Um, one is selection bias. And selection bias is a particular problem of studying older adults uh, because older adults have high mortality rates and also with increased illness may find it increasingly difficult to participate in a study over time. And if that selection process is related to air pollution exposure, which um, re with respect to results we saw previously, it might be, um, and with respect to cognitive impairment, uh, this could be a problem or at least a challenge. Um, Another challenge it involves the use of electronic medical records or claims to identify cases of dementia. And uh, those data are pretty prone to misclassification due to poor sensitivity overall, although there is also imperfect specificity. As you saw, there are sparse numbers of specific exposure outcome pairs. And one other note that really affects these results in particular, we would expect if TRAP is adversely associated with dementia and related cognitive outcomes, we'd expect all those findings to kind of lean in the same direction. But all the associations we found with cognitive decline that were reported, I should say, those were all very clearly null. And as a result of everything that I've said, um, we issued a low to moderate confidence rating in the presence of an adverse association of TRAP with dementia-related outcomes. Next. Now, there were six studies in five unique cohorts of Parkinson's disease. Of uh, those, again, range in size between uh, about 1,000 to over 2 million and occurred again in Europe and North America. There were three cohort studies and three case control studies. And most of these studies um, evaluated nitrogen dioxide with few studies of other pollutants. Next. In terms of the, the pattern of findings in these studies, uh, findings were inconsistent with respect to nitrogen dioxide. That means there were inverse and positive and null findings. Um, for the rest of the pollutants, there were just too few findings to really say much at all. The challenges are relatively similar as those for studying dementia. But what I want to point out that's unique to Parkinson's is the potential importance of finally adjusting for confounding by smoking, which paradoxically appears to be inversely related to Parkinson's risk. Um, and then as with the dementia studies, uh, findings were relatively sparse overall. And as a result of all of those considerations, we issued a low confidence rating in, uh, for the presence of an adverse association of TRAP with Parkinson's risk. And that's all I have. Jennifer, that was great. That was so nicely laid out to, to see how things fit together. And uh, we're, we're certainly still missing information. Um, you know, cardiometabolic disease and, and brain health are really thought to be connected. And it's really a major health research question at this time. So were you able to dig deeper into maybe the types of dementia, like vascular dementia, and see whether or not that, you know, may be more in line with some of the cardiovascular evidence that's there with air pollution? Right, yeah, we certainly would expect that. And I, what was really compelling is the evidence in this review specifically on a trap in relation to stroke risk. And stroke and vascular dementia kind of hang together. Um, vascular dementia can involve some subclinical stroke type events. Um, but it's, it's worth remembering that most dementia including dementias that clinically we would classify as Alzheimer's dementia, have mixed pathologies. In fact, that is the most, what I should say that one of the most common combinations of pathology in dementia is uh, plaques and tangles, the Alzheimer's pathologies, plus vascular um, pathology. And, and so it is exceedingly difficult to tease these apart in the absence of pathologic data. And making things even more challenging is if we try to rely on public, I should say, databases involving, say, healthcare use, uh, 
where we gain the advantage of numbers for sure, but we that comes with a disadvantage of the quality of data. And what seems to be the case is where the misclassification of dementia overall is a concern, the misclassification of types is even worse. So there is some promise in the horizon in terms of being able to disentangle these, these mechanisms, but, but with our evidence right now, we, we are not able to do that. Oh yeah, and it's uh, right. I mean, I think we've covered so much in this in this deep dive um, in a short time. Really appreciate everybody on the panel um, stepping up and sharing with you what you know. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some time for questions at the end. But it's now time to turn it over to the next part of this HEI webinar. And so I, I want to introduce our co-chair uh, Francesco Forestieri, who's a visiting professor at Imperial College in London and who, yes, was one of the co-chairs on this HEI panel. So Francesco, I turn it over to you for this next session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to... Okay. trying to share the screen and, uh, you know, of course, finding difficulties and uh, Okay, so uh, Anna, can you share the screen for me because I, I don't, yeah. I have yes, problems. Sure. That's fine for Francesco. Um, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay, and put in yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, thank you, Jeff. And uh, uh, thank you, HCI, for inviting me in this uh, webinar. You know, my duty uh, this uh, now is just to uh, ask ourselves, have you, uh, are we done with uh, traffic related air pollution? Have we finished or uh, there's something more that we should uh, 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 research, and this is the main question. And, and of course, I'll, I'll do that by reviewing in, in with two slides what the overall uh, conclusions of our report. Can you, next, please? Uh, uh, next, Anna. Okay, so this is a nice uh, picture of the uh, overall conclusion. And, uh, you know, the first striking uh, results, you see the, uh, with the red, the red buttons, you see the high confidence and the yellow button, you see the moderate to high. And it's a very, very strong uh, difference here. We have very, very um, high confidence in uh, for mortality but less confidence from moderate to high for mobility. And uh, all the uh, white bottoms are for moderate uh, uh, confidence that for uh, mobility outcomes. And next slide, please. The overall uh, summary is that we found high or moderate to high level of confidence for some mortality outcomes like all cause circulatory and ischemic heart disease mortality, uh, lung cancer mortalities that uh, Gerard Hook has shown, and for morbidity asthma onset in children and adults and acute, acute res respiratory infection in children. And I have to add uh, autism spectrum disorders as uh, Sharon has indicated. Uh, the evidence was considered moderate for all the other, uh, moderate or low, very low for all the other outcomes. Uh, and, and of course, as Fred said, uh, the results uh, that we have indicate that traffic air pollution remain an important public health concern. Uh, in, the, uh, in the report, you will find a long list of uh, research opportunities and uh, indication of where research should, should go. And uh, I will uh, illustrate some of them. Uh, next slide, please. So I have nine recommendations. And the first one is, of course, to improve exposure assessment to traffic-related air pollution going beyond uh, land use regression. Using satellites, of course, and the satellites can indicate can found the size and the shape of the particles. And there is an interesting project going on with satellites, the so-called Maya project. 
We should use more sensors to detect personal exposure to gas and particles. Social media are very useful for time activity patterns. Uh, we, we can detect markers of exposure using exposome and machine learning to uh, increase our statistical ability to detect uh, exposure, but always remember to apply regression calibration to address one important issue in, the, in the air pollution epidemiology, which is a, a measurement error. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, second recommendation, uh, conduct studies on two difficult uh, exposure. One is uh, ultrafine particles. And ultrafine particles uh, have the uh, uh, problems that they differ in space and exposure different in space and time. Uh, uh, experimental epidemiological studies suggest the short term health effects, but studies on long term effects are limited. So, more studies on ultrafine particles. And as well, more studies on known tailpipe PM components like copper and iron. We, in, in the traffic, um, a review we have considered them, them but few studies are, are available and this has been going on since the last two day, decades uh, but we uh, need better evidence for non tail pipe pm components next slide please and then we have a big issue which i call the no2 dilemma what is the dilemma is uh, no2 per se or is only a proxy of uh, uh, another component of traffic air pollution, or is a proxy of a broader mixture of correlated components that are all indicative of traffic air related air pollution. And this NO2 dilemma persists despite two integrated science assessments from EPA and Health Canada. One critical assessment from uh, coming up uh, uh, from U uh, United Kingdom and seven systematic reviews. And you see the results of the seven systematic reviews here, including the HEI traffic review recently published. You see the summary estimates are for the, for, uh, uh, for the different uh, uh, reviews, including different number of studies, are all consistent with an effect with uh, very small differences in, in the effect estimates. And this comes with a uh, next slide with the results of the large labs uh, court study on administrative courts. You know, in all, in all the areas in, in Europe where NO2 has been studied in association with mortality, all cause mortality, uh, labs found a statistically significant effect. And this effect, which is consistent with the other systematic review, uh, is not modified after adjustment for PM2.5, black carbon, and ozone. You see a very pretty consistent 4% uh, percent increased risk per 10 microgram cubic meter uh, increase of NO2. And next slide. So perhaps the indication is that to solve the NO2 dilemma, Instead of uh, uh, you know continuing uh, in uh, in uh, observational studies, we need to triangulate the evidence with experimental studies, and uh, this is mentioned here uh, to a nice uh, randomized controlled trial of NO2 in using bronchial response responsiveness uh, in uh, in uh, in patients with asthma. I just refer to this study with a, a very uh, nice editorial coming in the, in the Blue Journal in 2019. And all this issue was uh, uh, well described in, uh, in the invited perspective that I wrote to the, together with Annette Peters in uh, environmental perspective in uh, last year. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, we need to conduct studies in areas outside North America and, and Europe. We have plenty of studies in North America and Europe, but very few studies on traffic air, uh, related air pollution in, in Southeast Asia. And you see why this is important, because the exposure might be correlated with several other factors. You see from this slide, for instance, uh, the exposure to PM 2.5, personal exposure to PM 0.5 in Beijing is correlated with age, decrease with age, decrease with education, but increase with smoking, increase with BMI, and increase with respiratory disease. So this is a strong indication that the uh, uh, effect modifiers 
uh, modifiers of disclosure that should be considered in this specific countries. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we had plenty of morbidity outcomes where the evidence is moderate or is low, and uh, so we should pursue in, in addressing this uh, morbidity outcomes. And, and of course, we need to evaluate the criti critical windows of exposure for birth outcome studies and also for studies of asthma onset in children. Is the, is the critical window of exposure is the pregnancy, is the first year of, uh, years of life, or is the uh, current period? This is the question mark. And then um, regarding COVID-19, the, the uh, observational studies are, are coming now, conducted on the individual uh, subjects, not the ecological studies. And we need more studies looking at the incidence of COVID-19 hospitalization and mortality, especially during uh, and after vaccination programs and uh, with the new variants. And additional long-term studies are needed for COPD and acute respiratory infections in adults, cardiometabolic outcomes, and some of the mortality outcome uh, like COPD, stroke, and acute uh, lower respiration infections mortality. Next slide, please. Uh, we need to consider the cofactors that may co-vary with uh, traffic-related air pollution. Like one of this is poverty. In, in the left uh, part of the slide, you see the association uh, between uh, uh, one, one slide is asthma in New York and the other slide is poverty in New York. And you see the, the overlap of the asthma and poverty in this specific case. So we need to consider how this factor interact. And now traffic air pollution uh, is also uh, affected from noise and, uh, and also green space. There are very nice review indicating a very complex interaction between the, the different factors. And uh, I address you to this very uh, good editorial from Professor Manucci and Caroline Kona in the European Heart Journal last year. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, uh, transportation and especially new mobility may have uh, a lot of uh, opportunities to reduce exposure and also to uh, provide uh, a better health. And in this respect, we, we need to consider the so-called co-benefits like uh, physical activity and active transport that they can mitigate the adverse health effect of traffic-related air pollution. Next slide, please. Uh, there's all well, in, in the traffic review, we just consider clinical outcomes, but uh, uh, more insight can be uh, acquired by studying markers and, and subclinical outcomes. Uh, and, 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 and I think this concept of meeting the middle uh, that was uh, um, released in 2011 is very interesting. What is in the middle approach? So basically have uh, intermediate biomarkers and see whether they are related retrospectively to external exposure and prospectively to health outcome. And if this relation occur, then we can have a sort of validation of the causal hypothesis that we have. And this is very interesting approach I think we should pursue. Next slide, please. And, and finally, uh, you have seen you know, the troubles and the, the complicated way we have addressed the, uh, the synthesis of the scientific evidence uh, and the nature of the problem is really complicated. We had a long tradition coming from the EPA, the, the uh, integrated science assessment, having the, you know, the final synthesis with a very nice uh, final word like causal relationship, likely to be causal relationship and suggested to, but not sufficient to infer a causal relationship. But at a certain point, the, uh, uh, the great method came from clinical medicine. And one of the accusation of uh, um, observational studies is that uh, we don't have randomized controlled trial. Uh, since observational studies don't include randomized controlled trial, they should be considered of low quality. And this is an issue that we have been dealing for, for uh, the recent years. The next slide, please. 
And uh, I, I uh, uh, make a sort of summary of tension between the two approaches. One approach is the uh, application of gray that comes from the clinical uh, evidence, which is a sort of mechanistic approach to evaluate the confidence in the body of the evidence. On the other side, the so-called concept of triangulation of the evidence, which is very much based on the idea that consistency is the right word. So uh, next slide. So for this reason, you know, you, you may go through the, the uh, report, the HCI um, uh, traffic review, and you see how we use the two approach, the narrative and then modify HOA in a sort of complementary way. And we relied a lot on, the, on this so-called uh, narrative evaluation. Next slide, please. And, uh, and I think the, the indication is to improve the methods in evidence synthesis and try to use much more the uh, uh, narrative evaluation using the Bradford criteria, the criteria where triangulation and basically taking the consistency across different studies design and across, in our case, across various outcomes and across various exposure methods, I think is the, the uh, good way to proceed. So finally, next slide. Uh, uh, we had in, the, in our report some lesson learned regarding evidence synthesis that I just summarized here. Uh, believe, uh, use more the narrative approach uh, provide high confidence in observational studies, include all the studies in the evaluation, not only the studies that go into the meta-analysis, rely on the consistency of the association, and instead of mechanically apply the risk of bias tools, identify and quantify the key possible bias and see how they uh, may influence the results. So the final slide is the uh, conclusions and uh, just repeat uh, the research opportunities that we have improved exposure, um, in, uh, more studies on ultrafine particles and non tail pipe PM uh, indicators, evaluate NO2, more studies outside North America and Europe, um, conduct studies where the evidence is limited, uh, evaluate the role of spatial, spatially correlated factors like poverty and noise and green space, evaluate the full range of potential impact of transport, evaluate the mechanism behind the association and improve methods in systematic review and evidence synthesis. And the next slide, I want to thank all the HEI panels, the consultants, the contractors, and external reviewers of the um, uh, of this incredible effort, and of course the HCI staff, in particular Anna Borger, that led us through uh, uh, this very interesting research. Thanks a lot. So I guess we may continue with the questions and answers uh, session. We only have about uh, 10 minutes left for our webinar. There were lots of questions inputted into the relative box in uh, Zoom that were already answered. So I'm going to focus a bit on uh, those that were not answered by the respective presenters. A lot of the questions were addressed to uh, the definition of the traffic related studies. So probably I will address this to Ferd Lurman. There were a lot of questions related to how we took into account uh, factors affecting traffic related pollution, such as grayness, greenness, uh, or uh, contribution from uh, residential combustions. Even the definition of ultra fine particles emerged in the QA session that are uh, open as an open issue to determine what we mean when we define traffic related pollution. So, maybe a comment on all of this by Fred. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. I think, uh, you know, the uh, exposure, exposure framework was set up to select studies that were where the contrast was dominated by traffic, but in the real world, there are other sources that influence them. And um, 
you know, so there are were, were studies where clearly the other typical urban sources uh, were contributing to the contrast. Uh, and although the dominant part came from traffic in our selection procedure, you know, we didn't specifically, uh, you know, if some studies control for, for uh, green space or greenness or uh, NDVI and so forth, I mean, that was, uh, that was probably not the main analysis, the main model we used, uh, but it was, so it was, you know, not, not selected per se. Obviously that is factors that, that uh, can be associated with the outcome and you know, not considered directly in this study. Thank you, Fred. There is a related question that uh, maybe Jeff Brook wants to address. It reads, uh, the extent to which all of the pollutant metrics used in the selected studies should be regarded as largely equivalent markers of trap. Of course. If so, why might the associated outcomes differ between uh, pollutants and metrics? If we consider that they differ, if not, to what extent should we regard the outcomes as associated with exposure to specific pollutants? Thanks. That's that's a great question. And um, just you know, starting sort of working backwards, uh, I would say that you know that was not something the panel wanted to do was to think about each individual one and whether or not it tells us about that specific pollutant, like uh, black carbon being some aspect of carbon on particles. Uh, or NO2 being NO2 versus an indicator of traffic. So at this stage, they were all uh, taken out from you know, the literature independently as studies that had an indicator of traffic and the mixture in general, and they shouldn't be perceived as saying anything about those individual pollutants uh, with uh, what we've done in our assessment. Um, that will take certainly further work and different designs of studies to get at those really important questions. But for now, uh, yes, they're largely interchangeable and, and used in a sort of a complementary way to make our overall assessments, along with, as people have noted, uh, other indirect measures of proximity to traffic or traffic density. Uh, so, so they're all, yes, just imperfect markers, and that's an important thing, right? They're all imperfect indicators of traffic air pollution, uh, and that's probably that lack of you know, perfection that makes it difficult to really compare and say why the differences. Um, so that, that's, I think, in a nutshell, sort of the main thinking behind how we used those at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, also, to complement uh, Fred's uh, answer, reply, there is also a related question on the intracity uh, variation of air pollution concentrations and how these are um, affected by meteorological factors that Audrey wants to address. Yeah, okay, I can address the question. Well, just uh, to say that uh, meteorological factors were considered when modeling uh, pollutant levels, if I address properly the question. So some use dispersion models or land, in land use regression models per se, the met meteorological factors do influence pollutants that are measured. So they are considered, these factors are considered when assessing, uh, pollu estimating pollutant levels. AV, you're muted. Sorry, apologies for that. There's a question uh, whether we considered other risk of bias tools. I think uh, Hannah probably has already answered that. That you wanted to address the whole audience on that. Well, I, I mean, I can shortly. Yes, we we considered that. Um, we considered various tools, but at the end of the day, you know, we had to make a decision and, and you know, this, uh, this risk of bias tool from the WHO that, uh, that was also used um, in the systematic reviews underpinning the guidelines was really specifically on air pollution uh, studies. So that was, of course, that, that's, of course, a, a great advantage. That's why we, we considered that at the end of the day. Thank you, Hannah. I think there's a question, interesting question on ultra fine particles and basically the lack of evidence for ultra fines. Maybe Barbara's uh, more related possibly to cardiovascular morbidity wants to address this. It reads that uh, we have null or no evidence for ultra fines. Is this based on a lack of studies, lack of measurements? Can ultra fines be a real contributor of PM2.5 effects we are seeing? 
Can this be differentiated between tailpipe and non-tailpipe? Yeah, uh, well, thanks for this question. I'm not sure whether I'm the best person to answer this, but uh, I can give you at least one, uh, a few thoughts that I have. Um, so we've been, uh, I mean, really looking at, at ultrafine particles uh, intensively. Um, the problem is, of course, they, they have this very high spatial and temporal variability. And with the current exposure assessment methods, specifically for long-term exposure. Um, these are certainly not um, uh, ideal to um, assess a high uh, uh, um, spatial temporal variability. So we ha always have a relatively uh, high exposure misclassification in studies on ultrafine particles, most likely much higher exposure misclassification than we have, for example, for more, heterog more homogeneously um, dispersed uh, or, or distributed um, um, pollutants. And so um, that, I believe, is one of the main reasons why in the, in the few long-term studies on ultrafine particles so far, we do not see um, um, strong effects. Now, there is quite a few um, um, programs ongoing trying to uh, um, improve the exposure, the long-term exposure assessment for ultrafine particles. And I think um, they will, I mean, we will see what comes out of those, whether we can ex actually see um, more effects because um, as most of you will know in, in toxicology, these ultrafine particles actually uh, sometimes show stronger effects than the larger particles. So we'll see whether new and better um, exposure assessment tools will give us new insights into the epidemiology of ultrafine particles. Thank you, Barbara. I think because our time is running out, just to point out there was uh, some notes in the Q&A session on environmental justice uh, studies that are missing. And uh, furthermore, it was pointed out that there are no much uh, many studies on the related topics in uh, low and medium income countries that is definitely driven by the lack of appropriate exposure assessments that will lead into, uh, feed into health studies in that area. So there is uh, some urge to funding such studies in low medium income countries. And I guess this is for Dan Greenbound if he has any comment on this. And also a very interesting question, so if there are thoughts in HEI of producing a policy, a summary report for policymakers similar to what IPCC does. Dan? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Evie. Uh, first of all, I, I, I saw the suggestion about the summary for policymakers, and we have sometimes done that. Uh, for other reports we did, and it's a very good idea. This, there was a, a massive effort, as you can see, from a large number of expert people to put together this major report. Uh, and there is an executive summary but uh, of the report, um, uh, which is available on the website, but, but uh, it's possible that we need to think more about, about a, a somewhat ex, um, expanded version for for policymakers. And I'm sorry, the first part of the question, Evie? There was the, the need for more studies uh, addressing environmental uh, just health justice uh, issues and the more research in the low and middle income countries, starting from exposure assessment to go up to health epidemiological studies. Well, well, we couldn't agree more on environmental justice. We have a major planning effort underway and we're reaching out to the environmental justice community as well as the academic community to try and plan out the next steps that we would take, not just for environmental justice and traffic, although that's important, but more broadly for air pollution and environmental justice, particularly in an urban context. So we will be looking at that much harder. Um, and as some of you know, we do have a global health program, which is now working uh, actively in uh, countries around the world, in Asia, um, in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, and, and uh, now starting to work in Africa as well. Um, there's clearly fewer studies. We didn't preclude those studies from being here, but there are fewer studies on traffic in those locations, but we would love to see that uh, data set increase. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your input. I think we had to we have to conclude, although it's a very interesting and lively webinar and questions are keep coming in. Uh, I would like to thank all the panel uh, members for their incredible work they put into the traffic report. Those of them that were presenting uh, the results today, as well as the audience for making this a so lively webinar. We strongly believe that this uh, report will have a big impact, especially considering the slower than anticipated transition to an electric fleet, more so outside the US. So we expect it to be of much value. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and uh, close the webinar.